In this video, we're going to get started with our next major topic in the course, which is stereochemistry and chirality. So before we get too deep into the chemistry and the chemical implications of stereochemistry and chirality, let's just give a brief definition as, as really this field has um, ramifications sort of everywhere. So what we're talking about is stereochemistry. So intro to stereochemistry. It actually has nothing to do with sound, which is interesting, but it's the study of the chemical and physical properties. So it's kind of a field. It's the study of the chemical and physical properties having to do with orientation in three dimensions. So it's not so much a stereo sound as it is kind of a stereo view. Um, to get into and really um, understand uh, where stereochemistry is coming from and a lot of the nuances, what we need to do is first define something called superimposition. This is sort of a fancy word for um, an experiment. So superimposition, or to say superimpose, has to do with, um, it's, it's really a, a way of comparing two objects to determine if they're the same. Okay, to see if they're the same. Um, now, it's really hard to describe this in words, but it's actually a fairly like simple thing. Let's say we have uh, a basketball. Okay, I'm gonna take that basketball and I'm going to compare it to another basketball. Okay, so these two are basketballs. Um, there's some imperfections in our drawings, but let's assume that they're, um, you know, they have the same dimensions, they're the same size basketball made by the same manufacturer on the same day. There's nothing like glaringly different about these two basketballs. So we would say that they're the same. So they're assumed to be the same. Again, drawing is hard. <laughs> so we're gonna make some mistakes, probably you and I. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna superimpose these two. And to do that, it's, it's truly a thought experiment. Um, it's not a difficult thought experiment, but it's a thought experiment where we're going to take the two objects and sort of merge them together. And if every nook, cranny, crevice, edge, whatever, perfectly aligns between the two basketballs, or they can be rotated so that there's perfect alignment. Yeah, I mean, if we rolled one over and we merge them together, maybe the seams don't overlap. But let's assume we can roll them around in some orientation so that they have perfect alignment. And actually to show this in notes, I actually kind of draw it like this. But that kind of implies there's imperfect alignment. But we assume that they perfectly align with each other. Now, this is a thought experiment um, because you can't do this with basketballs, right? If you just push two basketballs together, they'll bounce off of each other. Um, so this is a thought experiment, but if we bring the balls, roll them around, seams align, everything aligns, the edges align, there's perfect alignment, we would say the balls can be superimposed. Alternatively, we could say the balls are superimposable. Now, when the balls are super, can be superimposed or the balls are superimposable, same thing, just using the words differently, we say the balls are the same. The balls are the same. Okay. So that's an, that's a, an example of superimposition or super, or testing for superimposability. Um, 
if we want to, to assign some words for this, superimposable, we would say um, a property of um, two or more objects that can be oriented such that they can be placed through each other. And I'm sure there's a better definition on the internet. I try to give you all definitions, unless it's like a, a physical law of the universe for some of these things, I try to give you practical definitions and ways of thinking about this. Okay, so why do we need to know this? Well, it's helpful if we're looking at things that, um, if we wanna see if things are the same or different. Now, with the basketball example, it's actually fairly easy to see when our basketball is different from some other ball. So maybe I try to draw a soccer ball here. Pick your favorite ball that's not a basketball. Um, these are, why did I pick the, literally like the hardest one to quickly sketch on paper? Okay, that looks awful, but let's assume that it's soccer. Okay, so we're gonna try to overlap these together. And maybe, I. this is not, doesn't have, I've played enough basketball and soccer, no, we're not going to have the same size ball. But let's say we do, let's say the edges align, but then our seams don't align, right? We've got basketball seams, trying to overlap with soccer ball seams. My point is, these are not super imposable. Another example I could draw is if a football, um, tried to overlap with a basketball and you know, there's there's just no way we'd ever get those I mean the shapes are different what we would conclude then is if they're not superimposable We have different objects Now that was fairly easy to see because a soccer ball is different than a basketball So we have different objects in that we know that because we can actually do an experiment because they're not super imposable Okay, so not super imposable. Now, what about some other things that we interact with in the universe frequently? Well, um, you know, right now this doesn't seem super useful, but what about hands? Hands, um, are they super imposable? Let's start there. Before we ask if they're the same or different, let's well, just Instead, at imposable, excuse me. Let's instead ask, are they super imposable from the start? All right, so again, my artistic prowess slash lack thereof is really on, um, <laughs> it's really being showcased right now in this lecture. There's a hand, let's call it our left hand. And we're going to take our, we're going to compare that to our right hand, so we're kind of palms up, all right? So this is a palm. Are they super imposable? Well, let's do the experiment in front of your screen. So we've got um, two hands left and right. Well, if I try to just push them through each other, right now it doesn't work because my thumbs are not aligned. Well, that's no problem. Let's flip it around. Now our thumbs are aligned, except for the fact that all edges need to match up. I've got palms on one side, I've got the top of my hand fingernails on the other side. This isn't going to line up. Okay, even though, I mean the edges line up, but we don't have palm to fingernail kind of congruency or lining up. And so what we say is, are these superimposable? No, they're not superimposable. That means they're different. Now, they're actually fairly similar, but similar is not the same. Similar is still different. Now, if we th sit back and think about this, and I said to you, like the big takeaway of this video was, hey, your hands, your left and right hands are different from one another. You'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. 
Um, why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because hands are similar enough to where maybe they should be like super imposable. Maybe they should be similar. I mean, I know I'm much better at writing with my right hand than my left hand and that sort of thing. And, you know, there's other examples of, you know, where one hand's better than the other, but uh, for the most part, isn't that just like muscle memory and like training and, you know, using hands over the course of a lifetime? Well, it turns out, no, there's something deeper here and we'll get to it in a second, but let's just point out a property of hands. Hands are also mirror images of each other. Okay, so hands are mirror images of each other. That is to say that if I take my left hand, palm up, got my left hand here, and I'm gonna hold it up to a mirror. I'm gonna call this a dash line. I'm gonna write a mirror plane. So it's as if my left hand is looking at itself in the mirror. All right, and we're kind of standing off to the side, doing our best to, to see both these things, the reflection as well as our hand. Well, the first thing that's going to be reflected is the thing that's closest to the mirror plane. That's gonna be our pinky. Ring finger, middle finger, pointer finger, and then our thumb sticking out over here. All right, so this is a mirror image or mirror reflection of our left hand. Now, what you should notice about this is this looks identical or is superimposable with the right hand. It looks like the right hand. It's the same as the right hand. Now, the left hand isn't the same as the right hand, but the mirror image of the left hand is the same as the right hand. Okay, so we're going to be talking a lot about mirror images of certain objects in the universe. And we're going to be talking about whether or not those mirror images are similar to or different from the original object. In the case of the left hand and the right hand, okay, we have, we have practical examples where we can see that, um, we can see that the left hand, uh, we can actually hold it up to a mirror and actually be able to use that object. Okay, so here's, here's my left hand. It's got a wedding ring on it, just ignore that. Okay, left hand. And then if I want to mess around with the mirror image of it, I just hold up my right hand. So I actually have both objects present with me. Now, it's not something that we, um, for the most part, have. Like if you've got, uh, <laughs> you've got a basketball and you hold it up to the mirror, you can't mess around with the mirror image. You can only look at it in the mirror. Here we actually have both objects and we can learn something from those. So let me just give us some perspective here. For the, for the most part, objects in the universe are superimposable on their mirror images. But some things like hands, Some things are not superimposable on their mirror image. Some things are not superimposable with their mirror image, I'll say. And if they're not superimposable, that means they're different from the object shown in the mirror. should lead with they are different from their mirror image. And again, this is odd, right? I mean, things, you hold up a mirror image, it should be like maybe similar. Maybe there's some writing that's backwards or something, but it should be similar. Now, what are some examples? These examples that these some things would be would include hands, okay, we've talked about that, feet, sugars, hmm, 
sugars. Now we're getting into molecules. Sugars are just organic molecules that have very fascinating, very deep um, biological properties. And proteins, ooh, more, more biomolecules. DNA, everybody's probably heard of DNA. And then it turns out that if you're a parent like I am, as you learn, Legos. Many, many Legos are, are, are uh, uh, not superimposable on their mirror image. Now, most of them are, but some. So I'm going to put some Legos. And when you're building Lego sets with your kids, it's the ones that are not superimposable on their mirror image that really trip up your kids. It turns out they're not too excited about a lesson in stereochemistry in the midst of building a Lego set. Okay, that's neither here nor there. What I want to get at is this uh, idea of a new word. It's in a very important word, and it's probably more important than the word stereochemistry, and that is chirality. So chirality is a property of, ob of an object. that is not superimposable on its mirror image. So what we could do is um, we could take this idea of chirality again. So anything in the universe that's not superimposable on its mirror image is said to have this property of chirality, or it's said to be chiral. So the majority of things in the universe are not chiral. Now, instead of saying not chiral, chemists prefer to use the word a chiral. A chiral. So we could label a basketball as being a chiral because if we take the mirror image of the basketball, ignoring like small writing and that sort of thing, subtle details, um, and we superimpose them, we would see that they're the same because they would be superimposable. If things are superimposable on their mirror image, they are achiral or not chiral. Let me make note of that. So superimposable on the mirror image. Okay. But many things are chiral. Chiral objects, again, not superimposable on mirror image. That idea of connecting the word chiral to whether or not something is superimposable on its mirror image is very important, and I keep hitting on it, are not superimposable on their mirror image. So we have chiral. We have a chiral. Chiral is not superimposable. A chiral is superimposable. Now we had some examples here. We had hands, feet, sugars, DNA, um, proteins. So proteins, some Legos, because I wanted to keep it fun. And it turns out some organic molecules. And it's these some organic molecules that we want to pay attention to for the next unit of our lesson. In particular, some organic molecules are chiral mol um, Many molecules are chiral, and in particular, molecules with carbons attached to four different groups. So if a molecule has a carbon atom bonded, let's put that in, bonded to 
four different groups, we say the overall molecule is chiral. Now I did qualify and say many. Many is most. It's not like Legos where it's like every some of those weird pieces. But any what I'm getting at is any time you have a carbon atom that has four different groups, A, B, D, and E. We'll skip C, right? Um, a, B, D, and E. One, two, three, four. Maybe one, two, three, four would be better. That carbon with its four different groups renders the entire molecule to be chiral. The entire molecule is now not superimposable on its mirror image. There are a few, a few examples where due to some symmetry elements, we can break this rule and we'll talk about those. But for the most part, I want us to start appreciating that anytime we've got a carbon atom with four different groups attached to it, the molecule is going to be chiral because of that one carbon atom. Okay, so this was the start of stereochemistry. I'm gonna stop here in the next lecture. We're gonna look at identifying chiral carbons and molecules and labeling molecules as being chiral, not superimposable on its mirror image, or achiral, superimposable on its mirror image.